It's a pleasure to introduce today's Jones Seminar speaker. Um, today we've got uh, Jing Fan, from, uh, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering from the City College of New York, uh, giving its talk. Uh, Dr. Fan joined the Department of Mechanical Engineering at CCNY as an Assistant Professor just in January of 2016. Uh, her PhD study was at the University of Hong Kong in the area of multiscale modeling, as well as computational heat transfer and fluid dynamics. From there, she was a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard University, working on microfluidics for materials production, multiphase flow and porous media, and topics related to the dynamics of complex fluids. Her current research is in the area of complex fluids and soft materials, such as coupling of transport processes in biological tissues, design and fabrication of functional porous materials, enhanced oil recovery, flood control, conformance control, uh, advanced materials for biomedical and optical applications, physics and applications of microfluidics. Uh, so the title of her talk today is Micro Microfluidics Enabled Fabrication Technology and Its Applications. So please welcome her. Thank you. Okay, it's, uh, I, I'm very pleased and honored to have this opportunity to introduce my work to, to you. And uh, the, what I'm going to talk about today is about microfluidic fabrication technology. So first of all, I want to emphasize that it's different from the on-chip microfluidics, uh, which focuses on the realization of uh, various functions in a small chip that contains micrometer-scaled uh, fluidic channels. So everything is done on the chip. And in terms of microfluidic fabrication, we have something coming out of the chip. And uh, actually, some of the key steps may happen out of the chip as well. So, and the key role of the microfluidic chip for this application is to make precisely controllable monodispersed emulsion drops. And when we talk about emulsion drops, it can be very simple, like the water drops in an oil or oil drops in the water, single emulsion droplets. And it can also be complicated. For example, if one droplet has two layers, we have a core and then another layer enclosing that core. And the whole two layered droplets are then suspended in another continuous phase. Then we call this double emulsion. Like this, we have a water core surrounded by an oil shell and then suspended in another uh, aqueous solution. And we can have triple emulsion, quadruple emulsion, or quintuple emulsion as well if we have three layers, four layers, and five layers in one single drop. So they can be complicated. And as you can see, all of these fabricated from microfluidics, they are uniform uh, in size. So that's the beauty of microfluidics because of their ability to precisely manipulate fluids uh, well, well in, a, in a very accurate way. So, and all of these multiple emotions can be most conveniently made by using this type of, this type of capillary-based microfluidics, which we make from glass capillaries. We taper it usually, this is a very typical configuration for the double emulsions. We have two tapered round capillary coaxially assembled in a square capillary. And because it's for double emulsions, so we have three inlets for the inner face, middle face, and outer face. Then we have a outlet for the double motion droplets to flow out. And uh, this video shows here is showing the generation of double motion droplets. And uh, but this device was well specially designed to make double motion drops with a very thin shell. So the shell thickness is only about one micron. So you couldn't even tell there's a shell there. They look very similar to a single motion drop, but they are double emulsion. And you probably heard about another type of microfluidics, which is PDMS based, fabricated from uh, by by solvent chlorophyll. And uh, in this case, PDMS based microfluidics chips are better at making single emulsion drops at very high frequency or it's relatively easy to integrate different components into the chip to realize different functions. 
for example, the device shown here is actually can sort the drops here into two groups based on if each drop has a specific protein or not. So it has an important application in biology, like high throughput screening. So our group uses both, but we have a focus on the capillary-based microfluidics, and we use this to we use the capillary-based microfluidic devices to make a variety of micrometer-sized materials, uh, such as cap particles, capsules, and vesicles. And then we are interested in using this microunits to construct larger-scale model experimental systems to study more fundamental complex related, related uh, problems. And today, I'd like to give you a few examples in terms of what we can do with this capillary-based microfluidics. And I group them based on the type of emotions of this product come from, single motion, double motion, or triple motion. Then at last, if I still have some time, I will spend a few minutes talking about uh, what we are currently focusing on, um, which is constructing bio-inspired 3D porous structure with the microfluidics in the units. So the first example is about the fabrication of polyhedral microgels, hydrogel microparticles. So this project um, was motivated by well, a variety of applications of the non-spherical microgel particles. So for example, they can be used to study fundamental research on um, self-assembly, rheology of particulate systems, transport of particles through narrow channels, or property structure relationship in materials. And uh, particularly for hydrogel material, hydrogel microparticles, they can also be used as delivery carriers of drugs or building blocks for the engineered piece of scaffold. So, and one of the most popular ways to make hydrogel microparticles, non-spherical hydrogel microparticles, is the lithography base, which means a solution of the pre-polymer, pre-polymer solutions flows through a microchannel, and uh, it is exposed to UV light through a mask with the pre-designed patterns on it. So, the part of the fluid exposed to the UV will be polymerized, resolidified to form particles, and then these particles will flow with the liquid out of the channel. But the limitation of this approach is that the achievable shapes is limited to 2D extruded shapes, right, because it uses a mask. And although there are some well, modification about this approach to generate truly 3D structures, but it involves a very complicated fabrication process. So we were inspired by the dispersion systems of two immiscible fluids, such as foams and uh, emulsions. And in these two systems, we know that if the volume fraction of the continuous phase liquid in the foam and the continuous liquid in the emulsions is very small, when the volume fraction of continuous phase is very small, then each of the droplet or bubble will just deform, they compress with each other and deform to non-spherical shapes. And a more a perfect example in nature is the honeycomb. So we have this beautiful hexagonal pattern and hexagonal cells in honeycomb. But the recent study has shown that it's actually the bees actually just build circular cells in the hexagonal packing structure. And as the bee wax is warmed up by the temperature of the bee's body, water evaporates from, from the, the wax, and the surface tension, surface tension drives the circular cells into hexagonal cells. So this beautiful structure should be more a credit to the nature of surface tension instead of bees. Okay. And you probably could notice the difference between these two type of systems. In this systems, well, the bubbles or droplets have completely irregular shapes because they are polydispersed. But in the example of honeycomb, every cell has exactly the same structure, the same geometry, the same shape, and the volume. So we were inspired by this, and uh, we, we thought that we could take use of the monodisperse emotion system as the template to make polyhedral microgel particles. If we have a pre-polymer solution in the droplet phase. 
then after we get the deformed droplets, then we can solidify them, we can freeze the shape by, by shining UV light on them, for example. So we start from the simplest case by just confining monodispersed droplets fabricated from microfluidics within two parallel plates. So when the distance between these two plates is very small, we have only one layer of drops acting between, right? So this is what we get in hexagonal packing. And uh, we control, we can control the volume fraction of the drops to have different shapes, like from circular disk to, to hexagonal disk. And we can control, for example, the edge sharpness of these particles by controlling the volume fraction. And we can also control the thickness of the chamber to get uh, hexagonal um, disks with different aspect ratio from thin disks to high, tall prisms. And if we have two layers of drops packed in between the thickness, when the distance between the two plates is uh, large enough, we have two layers of drops in between. And interestingly, when we have a relatively low volume fraction of the drops, we have this structure, beehive honeycomb structure. So each layer of droplets is on the hexagonal packing, and each drop locates in the center of three drops from the other layer like this. And interestingly, when we increase the volume fraction of the droplets in the system, we saw the slip of one layer of drops by a half lattice. So each drop is still in hexagonal packing, but each drop is located in the center of four drops from the other layer. So the whole system, the structure looks like this. It's called the FT honeycomb structure. And uh, we are actually very interested in why this structural transition happened. So we thought that, okay, and here we have an insect shows four adjacent units in this system. And they, are, they have exactly the same shape and, uh, and size. So each of them looks like a small house. They have a, a bottom, bottom face, hexagon, and then four walls, and then four roofs. Okay. So we were interested in why this structural transition happened. So we were thinking that because in such emotion system, compressed emotion system, surface tension, so surface energy is the main energy in this system. So the surface energy drives, it, this system is driven by surface energy to take a structure with the minimum surface energy, which is proportional to the surface area, right? So then to confirm our, uh, well, to, to test our hypothesis, we examine 16 independent regions of interest, which you can regard as 16 independent samples. Each sample has about 1,000 drops and over a wide range of volume fraction. Then we count the number of fraction of each structure, beehive honeycomb and FT honeycomb in these 16 samples. And we found that when the drop volume fraction is below about 0 0.915, the beehive honeycomb is dominant. And when the drop volume fraction is higher than this value, the other FT honeycomb structure is dominant. And then we did the calculation. We calculate the interfacial energy, because interfacial, energy, uh, interfacial area, which is proportional to interfacial energy. We calculate the interfacial area, non-dimensional interfacial area, of those two structures over a wide range of drop volume fraction. And we found that when the drop volume fraction is below about 0 0.935, the beehive is energy variable. And when the drop volume fraction is above 0 0.935, FT honeycomb, is not is favorable. So they roughly, they're roughly consistent with each other from the theoretical prediction based on equilibrium state, uh, equilibrium system with our experiments. But interestingly, in our experiments, if we look at the dynamic transition process within a emotion system, we found that the transition can actually occur and uh, in a volume fraction much lower than the 0 0.3935 predicted 
from the theory. For example, this figure, this video shows two examples uh, when the structural transition happened at uh, the first one happened at about 0.92, and in the second video, the transition volume fraction is only about 0.85. So there must be another reason besides the surface minimum surface air, surface energy. What is that? Then we figure out that that is actually because of the, so if you look back, because of the eightfold vertices and the beehive on structure, like this one. So if we uh, look at the history in this area, people have the so-called plateau's law, which describes the stable structure of a dry foam system or a emulsion system with one uh, drop in one fraction. It uh, requires that in a stable foam structure, every three phases, every three phases meet at one edge at an angle of 120 degrees. And every four edges meet at a vertex at an angle of 109 degrees, roughly. But for this eightfold vertices, obviously the eight edges meet at one vertex. So this structure is not stable. That's why in our real experimental system, any small uh, disturbance to the system will just uh, trigger the structural transition. So in in the real uh, emotion system, actually both the surface energy and this structural instability are the two reasons that drive, drives the structural transition. And uh, within this two-layered system, if we polymerize the drops when they are uh, deformed, we can get uh, this structure, the, 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 the micro, micro particles. And similarly, we can further increase the distance between the two plates. So we have multiple layers of drops pack, packed in between. And in this case, at relatively low volume fraction of the drops, we have the FCC packing structure. And uh, when the drop volume fraction is higher, is close to one, we have the DCC packing structure. And actually here I have a video showing seven layers, DCC packing structure from the first layer to the seven layer. Um, I adjust the focus of the microscope, but you couldn't even see the difference on this because they are perfectly packed in, in BCC. So every layer looks exactly the same. Mm, and uh, if we solidify the deformed drops at this state, we can get uh, this shaped microgel particles. They are truncated octahedron. And actually they have another name, a Calvin structure. And uh, why is that? This is because of a conjecture proposed by uh, Lord Kelvin in 1887. He asked this question, how to partition space into equal finite volumes with the minimum surface area? So maybe it's easier to think about the 2D version of this, this problem. How to partition an infinite large area into equal finite uh, uh, auto partition an infinite uh, uh, plane into equal finite areas with the minimum peripheral length. Does anyone have a guess or have an answer for this question? How to partition an infinite plane into equal finite areas with the minimum peripheral length? The answer is actually the hexagonal packing we saw in the horizontal structure. And, but this problem is a 3D version of that. And actually, he also proposed an answer to this question, which is the Kelvin structure. Every unit has the truncated uh, occasion shape, although actually, if you look closely to this unit, you will see a slight curve. Uh, each of this, uh, many of this, this hexagonal faces are actually saddle shape, not flat. This is Calvin's answer. And uh, after he proposed this question for over 100 years, no one could prove if this is a correct answer or not. And no one could, propo could propose a better system, a better structure, which means uh, with less surface area than the Calvin structure. And until 1994, a new structure was discovered 
which is called the wear film structure, which is discovered to have 0.3% less interfacial area than the problem structure. And uh, the periodic unit of this wear film structure looks like this. It has eight units in one periodic, uh, uh, eight elements in one periodic unit. And two of them are brittlehedron, um, have it, two of them have the same shape of brittlehedron, and the other six have the same shape uh, with, with 14 faces. Two of them have 12 faces, and the other six has, have uh, six faces. And uh, surprisingly, even people found that wear film structure is supposed to be better than Hubble's. But in real experiments, in the real foam or emotion system, people have never observed this structure, although they have little, well, less interfacial energy. And, and why is that? So, okay, so it's not completely accurate. So in 2008, actually, this building, the Beijing National Aquatic Center, was designed and, uh, and, uh, and uh, built inspired from the wear field structure. So this is probably the first realization of this structure in the real world. But scientists don't uh, accept this, admit this. So and actually the first realization in an experimental system in the lab is, was uh, conducted in 2012 when people use a 3D printed chamber like this. It's like a, tube, like a cube and uh, like a box with an open uh, with an opening. And five surfaces of this, all five surfaces of this box, have exactly the same structure as a wear filling structure. And then this rough surface serves as a guide to, to, to guide the packing of uh, bubbles in this chamber. <coughs> so for the first time, people realized the wear filling structure in the foam structure, in the foam system. And the whole system um, has about 1,500 bubbles, and each bubble has a diameter of about two millimeters. So they are kind of big. And we thought that, well, since we're feeling structure, it's actually has a lower energy, or it has a pretty low energy, uh, and compared to even the Kelvin structure. So if we observe Kelvin structure in the experiment, well, in principle, we should be able to get this if we give a little bit of guidance to the droplets, right? So then we designed a simple template containing array of, uh, arrays of uh, hexagonal pillars and uh, the dimensions of these pillars, including the distance between the pillars and also the height ladder dimensions of these pillars are carefully designed to be compatible with the wear filling structure. So we use this simple template and successfully realize the wear film packing structure in the, uh, in the, in the motion system. And uh, um, it actually, we can get uh, on the order of a million droplets within one sample. And so this results in the two uh, shaped microgels like this, which is exactly the two, two units we saw from the wear film structure. Um, so it's very similar to, we call it a template, template directed droplet crystallization. It's very uh, similar to the colloidal epitaxy when we have the layer by layer growth of uh, oriented crystal structure, even with the uh, uh, relatively, even the structure is slightly out of equilibrium, but because they have a relatively low energy, so uh, we can still get it. And the reason why we didn't, why people didn't observe this structure before is actually because this wear filling structure is not compatible with the smooth surface. But we can imagine that usually in, we use a container with a smooth surface to, to house the droplets. That's why people didn't observe it earlier. But once we give it a little guidance, they will be able to pack into this structure. So, okay, so this is the first example how we actually just use the microfluidics to enable the droplets, model dispersed droplets, to fabricate polyhedral microgels. And uh, I want to 
also emphasize that it is very challenging to fabricate polyhedral particles by other means. And but polyhedral shapes itself is a very with a very typical representative uh, shapes. So so oh, we were pretty happy with this um, result and this method. And this method, this strategy is potentially extendable to other materials and to realize other structures as well. Okay. So the second example is about the chemical responsive elastic microcapsules. And this project was actually directly motivated by an industrial application in the petroleum engineering. So we know that uh, the oil reservoir and the ground is actually a, a porous, porous medium. Crude oil is trapped in the interstitial space of the porous rocks. And people inject water into the reservoir to induce a high pressure to push the oil out. But with this method, we can recover only up to like 40% of the crude oil. How to recover the remaining amount of oil? We need the so-called enhanced oil recovery approach. So one way to address this question is to inject chemicals together with water into the reservoir. The chemicals could be polymer, usually very high molecular weight polymers, or surfactant or alkali. And the polymers are used to, well, boost the viscosity of the water phase to induce a more stable displacement. And the surfactant is used to decrease the interfacial tension between water and oil. So this let the trapped oil ganglia, uh, oil blocks in the reservoir easier to deform and then flow out with water. But there's a big problem with such chemical flooding approaches, which is some of the chemicals injected would attach onto the surface of the rocks and being wasted. And especially for the surfactant, we can imagine that only the surfactant molecule that's well, reach the interface between oil and water could function to reduce the interface tension, right? But many of the surfactant molecules will just flow away with water and uh, it's wasted. So how to improve the efficiency of the surfactant we use? So we propose to develop some smart capsules which can deliver the surfactant into the oil-water interface release their cargo in the vicinity of the interface only. This will induce a high local concentration of surfactant near the interface. Okay. But how to do this? We first of all want to prove this concept. So we need to make microcapsules with precisely controllable geometry. For example, the shell thickness, the size of the capsules, and also the components. For example, the concentration of the surfactant in and then we inject this smart capsules into a model course media system and examine their well, tr transport behavior and also examine the oil recovery efficacy using these capsules. So this is what we did. Use microfluidics to first of all generate uh, some model dispersed double emulsion droplets with a very thin shell. It's actually the device that I showed at the very beginning versus slide. So it works in this way. We have two tapered round capillary. The left one is called injection capillary, and the right one is called collection capillary. And they coaxially assemble in a square capillary. And beside of this two, we also have a much thinner capillary injected into this injection capillary like this. So this very small capillary is used to inject uh, interface, which is an accurate solution of the surfactant in this case. And the middle phase entered from here between this small capillary and this larger round capillary is a polymer solution, polymer solution in an organic solvent. And this polymer solution, uh, this polymer will actually become the shell material of the capsules. And the outer phase, another accurate solution. So the interface was broken into some large liquid slugs at this junction. And each of this liquid slug would then broken into small droplets. 
And during this time, a thin layer of middle phase oil will cover the water drop as well to form the double motion. And this is because of this oil wets the inner surface of this injection pepper. And uh, the polymer that we used is responsive to some chemicals in the crude oil. We know that there's aromatics in the crude oil, so we use a polymer that can be dissolved in aromatics. Uh, and then we make this double emulsion drops. And this video shows a, a real um, generation process. And as you notice, when this water slugs is breaking into small drops, we get a double emulsion. But in between two slugs, we have the oil phase only, and this oil will become single phase single emotion droplets like this. But because this oil drops have very different density with the double emotion drops like this. So later on, after we collect them, we can easily separate them by, by, by gravity. And also because the solvent that we use in the middle of this oil has, well, substantial solubility in water. So they will diffuse into the water drop. So only the polymer is left over to form the same shell of the capsule. So this is a moment dispersed capsule that we obtained. And we also characterize the thickness of the shell, which is about 150 nanometer. And we can precisely control this thickness by changing the concentration of polymers in the middle phase or changing the flow rates. And um, because we want those capsules to transport freely in a porous medium. So we use an elastic co well, block copolymer, and we characterize this polymer is highly elastic. So the resultant capsules are also very deformable. And we show that they are able to pass through a constricted channel with a throat size smaller than a half of the capsule diameter without releasing its cargo. Here we use a green fluorescent dye to represent the cargo. And in the next, we want to characterize their transport in a real porous media instead of just in a single channel. So what we do is that we construct a model porous media by randomly packing glass beads into another column. And uh, then we first of all saturate this column, this model porous media, with a model oil, which is a mixture of mineral oil and uh, toluene to represent, uh, to mimic the crude oil. And then we, after we, we saturate it with oil, we inject water. We inject uh, 10 pore volumes of water to recover most of the oil. So what is left in the column is some trapped uh, oil blocks, and they cannot move anymore. And then we inject the suspension of uh, capsules in water into this, into this uh, uh, por porous medium. And we use micro CT to visualize different phases inside. So these are the micro CT images. And this big white, big uh, light gray circles are the glass beads. And these dark black blobs are the oil blobs. And this gray region is the water phase. Although we, we did uh, include some X-ray contrast agents in the water phase to realize them. And these small white dots are actually the smart capsules we, we made. Although in this experiment, we encapsulate a high concentration of X-ray contrast agents instead of the surfactant, just to visualize their location, their distribution in the column. And we did it, observe that these capsules will go to the surface of the oil blocks. And here we control the concentration of the coloring of the aromatics in the model oil to make sure that these capsules will not uh, um, be damaged within a few hours so that we can still see them uh, uh, from the micro CT because micro CT scan takes uh, a few hours. But they do stay at the interface. And then we also characterize the release behavior of these capsules near an oil water interface. We originally suspend some capsules in water, and we have an interface like this. We give an initial velocity of those capsules. So once 
these capsules reach the interface, they stay there. And because in this experiment, we use a relatively high concentration of toluene, so within seconds, this capsule started to release its carbon. And also after about a minute, uh, they suddenly burst and release all their carbon nucleotides. So this, again, confirmed our hypothesis that these capsules are able to release their cargo near the deployed water interface. And finally, the most important step is to evaluate the oil recovery efficacy of these capsules. Again, we construct the model coarse media and uh, saturated with oil, inject the water to have some residual oil, and then we use micro CT again to scan the whole sample to get uh, the structure of the whole, uh, all the residual oil. And here we use different colors to represent uh, different sizes of the oil gum. Layer. For example, in this case, all the gum layer with the size between zero to 15 cubic millimeter, we have the color from blue to red. And any gum layer larger than 15 cubic centimeters will have the color of pink. So here you actually see this, all the pink gum layer is a huge, or maybe a couple of very big oil gum layer trap there. This is after water flooding. And then we inject one poor volume of capsule suspension. And these capsules have uh, surfactant encapsulated in the core. And after the capsule flooding, we flood another five poor volumes of water to help the um, the oil blocks move and the flow flow out of the column. Then after that, we scan the column again, and this time we saw much of the large oil blocks disappear, or they either disappear or broken into small oil blocks like this. And then we also compare this process with the direct surfactant flooding, which means we dissolve the same amount of surfactant directly in water and uh, inject this surfactant solution into the model porous media system. And we compare these two e experiments, and uh, we plot the normalized accumulated dumping volume as a function of the oil dumping volume. And so the main uh, takeaway point is that with the smart surfactant loaded capsules, we observed a 30% reduction of the residual oil. But with the direct surfactant flooding, by injecting the same amount of surfactant, we only observe 12% reduction of the residual oil. Although I want to um, point it out that uh, we shouldn't interpret these numbers quantitatively, but uh, we do we, we did we did repeat uh, this experiment a couple times, and uh, qualitatively this confirmed our hypothesis that by using these smart capsules, we do can save the amount of surfactant in order to get the same amount of the same oil recovery effect. Or by, by, by using the same amount of surfactant, we can get better oil recovery efficacy by using the capsules. Okay. So this is the second project I want to introduce. And then another example from double emulsions is uh, about the nanoparticle colloidosomes for thermally switch to release. This, is, this was an old work. Um, so first of all, I want to briefly introduce what is a colloidosome. So it is a spherical vesicle with a shell of densely packed colloidal particles, including a water drop. It was proposed to be analogous to the polymerosome or liposome, which are also spherical vesicles with a thin, well, polymer bilayer or lipid bilayer enclosing water drop, right? And also the colloidosome is, well, can be easily compared with the Pickering emulsion, which also has a water drop stabilized by nanoparticles, colloidal particles. But the difference between the Pickering emulsion and the colloidosome is that the Pickering emulsion is water drop in an oil. But for colloidosome, both the inner phase of the vesicle and the continuous phase is water-based. And actually the first 
the first uh, collagen was developed by fabricating Pickering emulsion first, and then transfer this water drops from oil to, to, to water. And this SEM shows the collagen very clearly. And in this case, this collagen consists of one layer of colloidal particles. Well, we can clearly see the interstitial pore among these particles. And uh, later, people developed a new approach using the double emulsion drops as the template to form colloidal zones. In this case, we have water in oil in water double emulsion, and we suspend nanoparticles in the middle phase oil. And after removing the oil from the double emulsion, we have the nanoparticles left to enclose the water drop and form a colloidal So obviously, colloidal can have either one layer of particles forming the shell or multiple layers of colloidal And colloidal similarly as liposome and polymerosome, were proposed as a potential um, drug carrier for targeted delivery. But we can see that because of the interstitial pores among these particles, colloidosomes are intrinsically leaky. Right? So this limits their application as a delivery carrier, especially to deliver some small molecule. Then the molecules may just diffuse through the shell, which is not good. Right? So to address this problem, we propose the system uh, as this. So besides the particle membrane, particle form membrane, we, besides of the active materials encapsulated in the core, we also have a temperature sensitive block copolymer encapsulated in the core. And this block copolymer will exist as individual molecules at uh, room temperature. And also, they like to attach onto the surface of those nanoparticles. So this close the pores in between these particles and uh, switch off the release. And at uh, elevated temperature, at 37 degrees Celsius, these uh, block polymers will detach from the nanoparticle surface. And they also will aggregate to, fire, to form my cells. So this will open the pores and switch on the release. So this allows us to switch on and off the release from this uh, system. And uh, we characterize the nanoparticles by TEM, and this is what we make them. We make, use a regular double emulsion device to make a double emulsion uh, droplets. And uh, these droplets will, double emulsion droplets will transform to Colloidal within second by a process called de-wetting, which means the middle phase oil will detach from the inner water core. And uh, this de-wetting process is actually because of a combined effect of the gravity, which drags this uh, middle phase oil downward, because in this case, the oil has a much higher density than water. And also because of the strong attractive interaction between the nanoparticles. So this induces the so-called the wetting process and induces the uh, colloidal zones like this. And we characterize their structure by cryo-SEM, and it shows the shell thickness at about 40 nanometers. And here, the cryo picture clearly shows the nanoparticles on the surface of these colloidal zones. And uh, actually, this surface contains a couple of layers of nanoparticles. And finally, we also characterize their release behavior um, by comparing two, two samples. We put one sample at uh, 37 degrees Celsius all the time for a total of uh, 20 days. And we put another sample, first of all, at the 37 degrees Celsius. After four days, we switch it to room temperature for another 11 days, and then switch back to high temperature. And uh, it cl clearly shows that uh, uh, the capsules, uh, sorry, the the collagen will release their cargo faster at higher temperature. And we should know that uh, their, their thermal responsive release behavior depends on how good this uh, thermal sensitive behavior depends on the size of the nanoparticles and the 
block copolymer molecules. And we should use the block copolymer, block copolymer molecules similar, well, with comparable size with the interstitial uh, pore size on the shell. And also, it also depends on the molecular size of the target, the active materials encapsulated inside. So this is uh, the third example. And uh, the next one, very briefly, only one slide. Yes, I will uh, go back soon. Very briefly, only one, one slide for this. So we developed some hybrid microcapsules for enhanced cargo retention. This is motivated by some, some application that sometimes people want to encapsulate highly volatile, small molecule hydrophobic cargo, which is very challenging. So if we want to encapsulate it in a hydrophobic shell, then, well, hydrophobic shell, if we use double emulsion, then we need the hydrophobic, uh, well, oil phase, middle in the middle phase, but also then the encapsulated cargo, which is hydrophobic, uh, it, it won't work. It, we couldn't have both oils as the inner phase and middle phase. So we came up with the idea to use the triple emulsion. We have a hydrophobic core, and then another water aqueous solution uh, core uh, uh, shell, and then encapsulated by another hydrophobic shell again. And this three layered droplets will be suspended in water again. So, and also we can solidify of the aqueous shell by using a pre polymer solution and uh, to generate a thin layer of hydrogel. And this hybrid. Hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hybrid microcapsules. Okay, this is the schematic to generate the triple emulsions. And then we, well, tailor the, uh, the aqueous, aqueous solution uh, shell from a PV solution to a solution to a hydrogel solution. And uh, we get a very good encapsulation uh, efficiency by using a hydrogel shell. Hydrogel and also a polymer shell, hybrid shell. And by this, we realize the encapsulation of uh, highly volatile pining, actually, uh, within these capsules for, for over 14 days, which is very challenging by using a traditional double emulsion templated uh, capsules. Okay. So these are just some, some examples about the different types of uh, functional materials that we can fabricate from microfluidics. And uh, at last, uh, as I said, our current focus for my group at City, City College of New York is to use this micrometer scaled units to construct larger scale uh, system. We are targeting on the porous, uh, porous structure and uh, we are studying the transport processes in porous media. And one application, one project that we are putting the most effort now is to construct a dual gel 3D in vitro model and study the coupled effects of interstitial flow and uh, abdermal uh, growth factor uh, diffusion on the uh, cancer cell migration. So we basically pack the microfluidic enabled uh, microgels and actually a more complicated gel loaded liposome into a porous structure and study the interstitial flow and the cell migration. And because we just started this new direction of research, so we haven't had any publishable result yet, but I want to give you, I do, they did find a paper published in 2015, uh, which uses a simplified configuration as our system, which probably can give you a better idea about uh, how the system looks like. So here, um, they, they also fabricate microgels from microfluidics, and they pack them into this microgel packing, and they propose this system as an injectable tissue scaffold. They encapsulate both, uh, they encapsulate cells in both inside of these gels and also in the interstitial space. And this is a 3D reconstructed uh, structure of this gel packing from Confocal. And uh, they show that this could be used as an injectable 
scaffold. They didn't focus on the transport process, but this shows a well simplified configuration of our system. Um, so this is how it looks like. And there's another very interesting system that uh, can be, later on I will explain how this can be constructed by using the microfluidic generated liposome as well. So in this case, they claim to generate a printed tissue. What they did is that they generate uh, accurate solutions into an oil, which has a uh, lipid molecule suspended in the oil. And this lipid molecules will go to the interface and stabilize the droplets. And this droplets, water drop, will also stay together to form a larger system. And they can control the osmolarity in each of these drops. For example, they use two colors to represent different osmolarity. And because they are touching each other, only a lipid by layer are separating these drops. So the osmolarity will drive the water flow from some drops into the others. So by taking use of this mechanism, they realized the folding and unfolding of this uh, system. And they claim that uh, it's actually some tissue-like behavior, folding and unfolding. And uh, I want to say that although they use the single emulsion stabilized by, by uh, lipid molecules in, in oil, but later on they actually also transform this to, oh no, they, they didn't transform them to water. But actually this system, can be easily constructed by packing liposome, which is, as I said, water molecules protected by a lipid bilayer, which has exactly the same structure as real cells. Um, so we are actually are, uh, currently also working on building this giant unilamellar lipid vesicle. This is not from our work from my, my, my previous colleagues, but we uh, now also making this liposomes as well. So basically because we have two lipids to generate this membrane, and uh, the same type of lipid tend to aggregate together. So we, we can label the two different lipids with different fluorescent dyes, so we can clearly see the group the aggregation of this lipid, and it's separating into two groups. And so by packing this liposome, we can also easily replicate this, this type of structures. So this is also one of our current projects. So by constructing, by packing microfluidic in the units, we can generate many bio-inspired porous structures. Okay, so at last I want to uh, um, well, thank my collaborators, um, which contribute to the, the, the result I just presented. And uh, also, this is uh, a picture of my uh, my current group. We have I have now two graduate uh, PhD students, Ali and uh, Shai Jin, and a master student, Hong Da. Um, so they are now uh, working on our ongoing projects, and they did a fantastic job. And I also want to appreciate the financial support from ECSPRF. Um, okay, and in the last slide. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions from, from you. Thank you.